Hello, Church. I am Simone Correa, Brico Campus Director, and I'm here to welcome you to our online experience. If you knew, first time here with us, thanks for tuning in. You're going to see some links popping up in the comment area. That's a good way to connect with us. But for right now, I'm going to pray that God will open our hearts, we will open our minds, that we can receive his words. Let's worship together.
altar of broken stone, but you delight in the offering. You have the heavens to call your home, but you abide in the song we sing. Ten thousand angels surround your throne to bring you praise that will never cease. But hallelujah from here below. Still your favorite melody We sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah We sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah
Hello, church. I want to invite you into a time of giving. This is something that we do every week because we are a family. It is God's desire that the life of Christ be reflected in our lives. And one of the ways, one of the key ways that the life of Christ be reflected in our lives is through generosity. Uh, In the book of Philippians, in the letter to the Philippians, the apostle Paul writes uh, the following, uh, verse five, uh, Philippians two, verse five, have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Uh, Paul reminds us that Jesus emptied himself. He cleaned up his bank account, all his resources. He gave his life for us. And if we desire to follow Jesus, we must follow him in this act of generosity as well. Generosity comes obviously more than in one way. It comes through words, comes through, comes through gesture. It comes through time that we give. But it also comes to the giving of financial resources. We live in a day and age and in a time where needs can be met through financial resources. That is probably one of the most efficient ways to meet needs. And so we give towards that. And so today, if if you feel called to identify with Christ, who has emptied himself in generosity, I would invite you to give. You can do that in a few different ways here at Crossbridge. You can either click on the link that's in the comment section below. If you are watching from our website, there is a give button uh, right above the page, on top of the page. Uh, if, if you choose to do it old school and mail a check to your campus, you can do that as well. And I pray that uh, your gift today, along with all the other gifts that will come today, uh, will come to meet the spiritual, the physical, social and emotional needs of people in our city and beyond. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for emptying yourself for our sakes. Father, of giving, for giving uh, that which was most precious to you, the life of your Son. Father, today we want to model the life of Jesus Christ through our giving and through our generosity. Father, we pray that uh, these resources would be stewarded wisely by the leadership of this church and that lives will be changed and transformed in a myriad of ways by that, w- that which we give today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey church, so glad that you are joining us this evening for worship as we begin episode three of our series entitled, We the Church. And the title of this sermon is, With Roots and Wings. This comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. And so if you have your Bible at home, you can turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, or you can always read on the screen below. Here's what God's Word says to us. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I have 
been fascinated with a craze that has taken place in the last several years, and, and you may be a part of it, and that is the house plant craze. So if you are a house plant person, in the chat right now, put a plant emoji or a thumbs up or a watering the plants emoji because it's a lot of what you do. But it's so interesting, this house plant craze. I mean, I've read reports on nurseries, especially that sell succulents and, and specifically tailored towards houseplants, have exploded over the past several years as millennials in particular have kind of engaged in this houseplant culture. There's a picture I actually want you to see of what it looks like, and this may be your home. This picture of someone with all these plants and tending to them and caring for them. And a lot of reports have come out about what why this fascination, why this craze with having plants inside your home to a degree where it's overtaking many homes, maybe yours. And the studies and the surveys have come back and said it's because what plants provide is something that is missing for a lot of people, especially young people. It's one, the ability to nurture something, as, as many are still advancing in their careers and maybe have not found that romantic partner that they want to spend the rest of their life with and, and marry. So you have the opportunity to nurture and to care for these plants. Many people said that they love having plants in their house because it causes them to slow down, distracts their mind, the focus on keeping these plants alive. And then lastly, and I didn't know this, but there is a rich online plant community where they tell each other tips and tricks and how much sunlight and how to water. And I see people like watering plants with ice. There's all these different strategies. And there's this community of connected people. And you see it because there's a lot of people that post on social media, all their plants and all their responses. I recently got into the craze. Pretty sure my plants will not survive. And I bring this up because actually all throughout Scripture, there is analogies and language about plants, plants and trees and roots. In the book of Colossians, it talks about being rooted in Christ. In the Psalms, it talks about trees and plants and talks about uh, that when you trust in the Lord, it's like you're planted as a tree by living water, by water, and your, your roots go out. Jesus himself says in the Gospels that anyone that is not rooted will wither away. So we see this analogy all throughout Scripture, and we're going to bring this biblical analogy into our text tonight in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. And we're going to see how we are to love with roots and wings. And I want to take that first part uh, for the bulk of our time to look at how we are to love with roots. Now, I did some study on the root system this past week because I'm born and raised in the city. I know very little about roots and trees. That's why I only have houseplants. And I learned about the different aspects of a root system. And so if you, ch if you look at this picture that's going to be on the screen right now, you'll see the different kind of uh, letters by the different roots. Now there's three types of roots, main, three main types of roots. There is the tap root, which is letter A on the picture. There is secondary or lateral roots. They're the ones that spread out. That's B and C on the picture. And then there are sinker roots. That is letter D on the picture. And this is what makes up the root system of a thriving and healthy tree or plant. And so I want to talk first about that lateral root B and C, the root that spreads out. Now, lateral roots are interesting because they weave together. They form a network of roots that surrounds the tree, and they go searching out in different directions for nutrients, mostly near the surface. And as they spread out, they continue to link together, and their strength is provided by their unity. That even there are some roots on one side of the tree and some roots on the other side of the tree, they are actually all connected to a network. And when they're connected and rooted together, they have the ability to break through any obstacles. If you were a kid and you liked riding bikes and ramping your bike off of the sidewalk where it would kind of break apart because a tree root would go into it, that is a lateral root. 
woven together with other roots under that you don't even see that enable it to push through obstacles. And loving with lateral roots is what we see here in verse 9 through 12, that you are to love with lateral roots, which is your church, the network of people that God has put you around, that you are to be united with, that you are to love, and that when you're woven together, you can break through obstacles as one. Look, look what the Apostle Paul says here in the book of First Thessalonians. He says, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. He says, listen, I'm going to talk about brotherly love, the love that you have for each other in the church, but I'm going to tell you that you don't need me to remind you about it because God's already taught you. And then he says, for indeed, this is what you are doing to all the brothers in Macedonia. So you are loving each other. You are already doing this, but we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. He says, you've already been loving. You don't need me to remind you. God has already reminded you that you're to love each other. You're to be woven together, united together in love. And you've already proven it by how you have displayed that love to those in Macedonia. But I want to urge you to do it more and more. I want your love to be increasing. You see, church, our love for each other is not a one-time event or occasion. To love your church to have lateral root love is to love everyone in the church. Not just the people that are easy to love or the people that you're most connected to or the people that you like or you vibe with. It is to love everyone. To be woven together with everyone. You may say, well, that, how is that even possible? How is it possible for me to be woven together with everyone? Well, it's possible by the way that you engage and the way that you show love and the way that you care, the way that you spend time with your church. It doesn't mean that you're in close proximity to every single person because even in the lateral roots, they're spread out going in different directions just like we are. We are all different people going in different directions with different jobs and different responsibilities and different things, living in different parts of the city or in different countries even. But we are connected together, woven together, and we are to love each other. All of each other. That means we are to love the people that are here online right now, the people that are not, we are to love the people that have left the church, the people that we're praying that would one day come to the church. We're to love the people in the church that are difficult and hard to deal with, the people that you kind of want to avoid or you don't want to see their name in the chat, the people that you, you think they're nice, but I kind of wish they went to a different church. We are to love all of each other. Now, that doesn't mean that you love without boundaries. Love has boundaries. It means that you, your love still should have discernment and wisdom, and it may not be wise for you to be in close proximity with every single person in the network, in the church family. Just like the lateral roots are separated by distance. But it does mean that you are to fight to love those in the church, that you are to try to treat people, not as they are, but as if they are already who they ought to be, and that you should hope to be treated that way too, that you are treated as you ought to be, not maybe as you are. Jesus says something so strange and so, so shocking and so difficult when he says that we are to love our enemies. How do we love our enemies? Well, we see them as not our enemies. How do you love difficult people? Well, you see them as not difficult people. Now, they may still be difficult. I mean, let's just be real. Some people are difficult. Maybe you recognize that you are difficult in many ways, and some people just don't connect with you because of differences. And your enemies may remain enemies, 
But what Paul is telling us here is that we are to fight to love each other more and more. It doesn't mean we don't have boundaries. It doesn't mean that we're in proximity to everyone, but it means towards the church. As Paul says in the letter to the Corinthians in chapter 13, that we are to love each other by being kind, by being compassionate, by hoping for the best, by persevering, by believing in each other, by not being proud and boastful or arrogant, by not celebrating evil, that we are to love each other with patience. Difficult people. People that we don't connect with. See, to have lateral root love is to do exactly what Paul is saying here. It is to see that God has called us as the church to love each other. And that is more and more. It is increasing every day, every week, every month as we have new opportunities to be patient or kind or compassionate or not arrogant or to have hope. And as we begin to do this, as we begin to love each other more and more, and we see that our love is to be directed towards everyone, not just the people that we connect with, we will begin to identify where we are to have sinker root love. So as we have lateral root love with t- towards everyone in the church, then we begin to identify where we are to sink our roots. If you check the, the picture again of the root system and you look at letter D, you see the sinker roots, that they go deep. See, when they establish a position and they believe that there are nutrients below the surface, whether it may be water or within the soil, the roots go deep down to sustain the root system. And so we are to love laterally everyone, but we're also called to love with sinker root. Love like a sinker root by digging deep with those that we're in close proximity with. So who are the people in your life that you are to dive deep with? Have you identified those people? Do you have those people in your life that you're diving deep with, that you're loving them by being vulnerable, by actually letting people know, hey, here's who I really am by being generous towards them, particularly with your time, by sacrificing for them, which may take on a multitude of things, but one of the things that we may have to sacrifice is our own pride to think that we don't need deep relationships. So are you being generous and vulnerable and sacrificial? And here's the last one. Sinker root love isn't only generous and vulnerable and sacrificial, it also perseveres. Meaning, friendships and deep friendships are not always great. There are difficult seasons. There are seasons where there are no nutrients and it is a dry season, but are you pushing through? In fact, when the season is dry and when the relationship is strained, that is exactly the moment to push deeper, to go deeper, to take in the nutrients that are farther below the surface. Who are those people and do you have those people? See, here's my fear, church. My fear is that many of us have relationships that we think are deeper than they really are. That many of our relationships that we might qualify as deep or sink or root love that we have towards these people is really just kind of lateral root love And it's just a little bit below the surface, but it's not really deep. And and if that is true of you, if you don't have anyone in your life that you really go deep with, you know it and you feel it. We all do if we're in that position because in our society, we have a culture that accepts surface level friendship. We have a culture that has an issue of loneliness And loneliness is not a problem for those that are introverted. Loneliness is not just a problem for those that are workaholics and have no time for people. Loneliness is not a problem 
for those that, that feel socially awkward. Loneliness is not a single person problem. Loneliness can find its way into the life of those who are most social, those who hang out with people every single night. Loneliness can be found in marriages. See, loneliness is a sinker root issue. It is a sinker root issue. It is because in your life, you may not have anyone, close friends, even a spouse, that you go deep with, that you're vulnerable, that you're generous, that you're sacrificial with, that you persevere with. George Hill is a columnist at uh, the Lake, uh, Salt Lake Tribune, and he says this, Loneliness in academic proportions is producing loneliness literature of sociological and medical findings about the effects of loneliness on brains and bodies and on communities. There's a growing consensus that loneliness, not obesity, cancer, or heart disease, is the nation's number one health crisis. Research indicates that loneliness is as physically dangerous as smoking 15 cigarettes a day and contributes to cognitive decline including a more rapid advance of Alzheimer's disease. Loneliness is a problem, and it is a sinker root problem of not having deep relationships. It is so easy, too, to be lonely. That may sound weird. It is easy to be lonely. And it's easy to establish loneliness by the beliefs that you have, by the rhythms that you have, or by the practices in your life. And I thought of three things that contribute to loneliness and make it easy. One of them is digital addiction contributes to our loneliness. There's been a lot of studies about this. One study that I read this week said that people that spend two hours a day on social media are, are more likely to be lonely. Two hours. You may be thinking, oh man, that sounds like it should be way longer. Two hours is really easy to be on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok. It makes me two hours maybe to make a TikTok dance. Contributes to loneliness. Now we know the effects of digital addiction and social media. We've heard it before. We know that social media and, and, and just a digital world can provide a lot of great benefits to our life and it's really helpful and important in a lot of ways. And we also know that it can give us the illusion of connectedness, that we can look into people's lives and think that we know people, but we don't. We know all of this, but it doesn't make it any easier to not just be comfortable with feeling connected to people through a digital screen. I'm going to make a confession. I get the weekly, you know, the weekly screen report from Apple, and it's almost always a little nervous when it pops up out of the blue. I never know when it's going to happen. And a couple weeks ago, it came up and it said that I had a 12% decrease in screen time. And I felt really proud. I was like, look at me. Maybe I'm reading a book. Who knows what I'm doing? but I'm not on my screen, 12% less. But the fact that that brought me so much joy, I mean, that kind of is concerning to me, that we have an addiction. And here's why this contributes to loneliness. It's not only because we're addicted to our phones or our, our computer or our TV and we're on it too much and we're not connecting with people, but it's also because we're being programmed to reveal to people the best of who we are the pictures, the filters, the tweets. We want to reveal to people the best of who we are. And so when we're given opportunity to dive deep into relationship with people where we have to reveal the worst of who we are, that feels really uncomfortable. And we don't want to do it. It's a culprit of loneliness. But there is another one, which is work isolation. And this is true pre-COVID and certainly true post-COVID that we isolate our work away. You may have felt like that more than ever because it's you and your computer. And maybe before it was you and your cubicle. Maybe the people that you work with, it's just people that are assigned to turn a profit for the company or accomplish a task. That there's really not a lot of team in your work environment. 
And it's because we have created this mentality that our work is about achieving our dreams and goals to establish the life that we desire. We even speak like that. We say that I'm trying to discover work-life balance. As if work isn't a part of life. Work and then life. Two separate things, they don't meet. So many of us go to our jobs and our careers and we go work to try to establish the life that we want in the future. This is dangerous. Because what happens is when you view your work as isolated from your life, and that you're doing, and you're hustling, and you're grinding, and you're trying to achieve all these things, that you can have this kind of life in the future, guess what happens? It causes you to miss out on what's in front of you, the people in your life that you can connect with and dive deep with, the relationships available. It causes you to sacrifice friends and family so that you might achieve some utopian life in the future isolating our work away from our life can lead to loneliness. And then lastly, another culprit of loneliness is the utility of friendships or the utility of communities. Many of us, we treat our friends and our communities like a utility, like something to provide a benefit for us. What am I getting out of my friendship? What am I getting out of this community? What am I getting from this church? And we may not always consciously evaluate based upon these questions, but I would dare to say that unconsciously, we look at relationships in our life and we think to ourselves, what is it providing me? Is it worth my time? Is it worth the investment? Is it worth dealing with that baggage or that negativity? Maybe that's for somebody else. Maybe I'll move on. Or oh, now I see what they really think. Especially this past year. And now it's time to distance. Because I don't want that. We look at communities the same way. Especially in church. What is church providing me? Is it benefiting me? Is it worth my time? Are they going to ask something of me? I don't, I don't know if I want that. It, it, it may go find a different one. Instead, we treat friendships and communities and even church like a utility. And we've lost our stomach to deal with difficult people. And we've lost our stomach to deal with difficult communities. And so we just kind of float around to different friendships and different churches or different communities as long as they're providing a benefit to us. And then when they don't, we kind of move on. And so we never actually sink deep roots whether in a community or in a church or in a small group of people. We're always on the surface, and it contributes to our loneliness. Contributes to our loneliness. You see, church, we need to not only love like lateral roots, spreading out, being woven together, united, as the church loving each other, but we also need to sink deep roots with a few people where we can actually be vulnerable and generous and sacrificial and persevere through hard times and difficult discussions. We're to love like lateral roots and to sink our roots deep as well. You may think, I do a pretty good job of that. I think I love like lateral roots and I, I think I have some deep friendships. Well, here's a challenge. If I were to ask you, do you love people well? And you were to say, yeah, I think I do. My next question would be, can I ask them? Can I ask your spouse? Can I ask your best friends? Can I ask your church if you love well? That may make you a little bit nervous. You may think, well, not always. And you may think, oh, I have some work to do. I don't really even know a lot of people in the church or maybe I, I haven't really gone as deep as I should with some friendships. I've been kind of on the surface and I've been avoiding it. Or maybe even at home. It may expose you a little bit. and You may think that you have a long way to go. I think that question exposes all of us that we do 
have a long way to grow in love. But I want you to hear this if you hear nothing. You cannot love like lateral roots spreading out among the network and the family of your church, and you cannot love people deeply unless you're connected to the love of the taproot. The taproot on that image is A, letter A. The taproot is the primary and the first root. It is the one that grows the deepest. It is the strongest. In fact, it never stops growing as the tree or the plant matures. Without the taproot, you do not have a root system, and you don't have a tree. The taproot is Christ, the first and the primary root. We remember that Christ, in Christ that God loved us before we ever loved him. God loved us before we ever loved him. In fact, we were enemies. We treated God like utility. Maybe that was your story. I know that was my story. That God was someone that I, go, I went to when I needed something from him. When I needed to pray to receive something. It was utility. No real friendship, no deep relationship, no connection. And yet God loves you like he loved me. Even before I ever felt any love towards him. You see, we, the church... We are stabilized and we are grown through Christ as the taproot, the primary, the deepest, and the most important root in the tree. And when we receive Christ's love, then we are grown. Then we can love laterally. Then we can sink deep roots. But if we haven't, and if that has kind of faded out of your mind and you don't see Christ as the taproot, the deepest and most primary root, the love to which you should receive everything, then it will cause all types of effects in your life. See, if you're not receiving your deepest desires from the love of Christ, which is to be known and to be valued and to be loved, if you're not receiving that from Christ, then guess what will happen? You will try to find it in other people. And so, you will not be capable of loving laterally because you only want to love the people that benefit you. You don't want to be near. You don't want to have any association. You don't want to sacrifice or do anything for other people that won't benefit you. So you have a utility mindset and your friendships, and you're not willing to go deep with people because you don't want to be exposed because you want to keep things for your benefit to make you feel valued and loved. And if you open yourself up to people, well, they, maybe they'll judge you. But when Christ, as the taproot of your soul, reveals to you and reminds you that you are loved and that you are valued and you are known by God, you can be real with people. You can sink roots deep. You can love your church, spread out and unite with people different from you. You see, we, church, as we said last week, we are broken people. We are broken people. We are selfish people. We make a lot of mistakes. And the way that our relationships are fostered is much like the, a marriage is fostered by having healthy expectations and by looking to serve and to love without needing to be served or loved in return. That is what Christ as a taproot reminds us. Listen to what is said in Mark 10, verse 45. It says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Christ came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. See, so what does Christ show us? He shows us that he loved everyone, even his enemies. When Christ was put on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When difficult people in the church or friends wrong you or hurt you, have you ever prayed that prayer? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know how much they're hurting me, or maybe they do. Forgive them. Christ loved everyone, even his enemies. But Christ also loved a few people deeply. The 12 disciples, 
poured time into them, sacrificed for them, was generous with them, persevered with them when they were making mistake after mistake. Christ shows us how to love. He shows us that because He gave His life for us, we can open our lives to other people. He showed us that because He served us by going to the cross on our behalf that we can serve other people. He shows us that because we are loved by God, known and valued, that we don't need to seek out love in other people. We can just seek to love people. He shows us how to love. I love this quote by Soren Kierkegaard, the philosopher. He says this, The self-lover is busy. He shouts and complains and insists on his rights in order to make sure that he is not forgotten, yet he is forgotten. But the lover who forgets himself is remembered by love. There is one who thinks of him, and in this way it comes about that the lover gets what he gives. You see, there is one who thinks about you, church, and that is Christ. And when you empty yourself and forget about needing to be remembered or needing to be valued or needing to even be appreciated, but you just love, sink deep roots with people, love your church, you're reminded that you are already known and loved and you get exactly what you give, which is love. And only then, only when you love with roots, can you actually love with wings? Closing quickly, when you love with wings, you think about a tree sustained by these lateral roots, the sinker root and the tap root, and as a tree grows, I like to think of the image of birds living in the tree and they fly out. And they come back to the home. See, loving with wings means, means movement. It's going out somewhere. Paul closes here, and he says that we're to love each other, and it's increasing more and more. In verse 11 and 12, he says that we're to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. This is what it means to love with wings. He's speaking about how to live with outsiders. When you go out from the church, from those deep relationships you formed here, from the love that you found in this unity, in this family, from the reminder every Sunday and in community with your church that Christ loves you as a taproot, when you go out into your work, into other social circles, to outsiders, those outside of the church, Paul says, here's how you are to live. Here's how you love with wings. He says, live quietly. What does that mean? It means be approachable and not contentious. Be approachable, not contentious. He says, mind your own affairs. I mean, don't be a person of gossip or envy. Don't be concerned with what everyone else has. And, and don't be concerned with the issues of other people. Mind your own affairs and work with your own hands. Focus on what has been entrusted to your care. What you are responsible for, your family, your employees, your clients, your opportunities, those in your office or your building. Focus on what has been entrusted to you. And when you do this, when you are approachable and not contentious and you're not giving into gossip and you're, not, you're protecting yourself from envy and you're focusing on what God has entrusted to you, then you can love with wings. It is how you walk properly with outsiders because what begins to take shape is there's a confusion. There's a noticing of living that way because it's living with love towards others. And the most powerful force for change in the world is love. And being not contentious and approachable is to love people. Not giving in to gossip and envy is loving people focusing on the people that God has around you, really focusing on them, is loving people. It's loving people with wings. See, church, what we see here in this passage is that we are to love with roots. We're to love each other. 
We're to love Christ so that we might go out into the city and to love with wings. That we might go out sustained to love with wings. So my prayer for you, my prayer for myself, is that we would think deeply about how we love with roots. Do we love the church? Do we have deep relationships? Is Christ the taproot of our soul, sustaining and giving us all we need? And do we feel sent out to love with wings to those that have been entrusted to our care, to be approachable, not full of gossip or envy? This is who we are, the church. And maybe you tonight have felt like an outsider. Maybe you felt like, you know, I, I, I'm looking in and I'm, I'm hearing about Christ inviting me in and, and loving me and maybe you feel like you've been treating God as a utility for much of your life. Maybe you're at church tonight because you felt like you needed something. I want to remind you that in Mark it says that Christ came to serve and not to be served by giving his life as a ransom for many, and that many is you. He gave his life for you. So that though you, like me, when I formerly treated God like utility, when I was an outsider, that he invites people like us in to faith, to find him as our, our tapper, to find everything we need in him that we are known, we are loved, and we are valued by God. If that is you, I want to invite you to pray with me tonight. I want to invite you to pray and invite Christ into your life. Don't let the moment go by. Don't say, I'll think about it later. Pray tonight. Because you're invited into his family, into relationship with him, a deep relationship. So will you pray with me? God, I pray that I would see you for who you are. The most important relationship that I would see that you loved me before I ever loved you. Christ, thank you for giving your life for me. I believe that. I pray that I would sense, even now, you as the taproot of my soul, sustaining me, giving me that love that I so deeply desire. Thank you that you invite someone like me into relationship with you. I believe in you and I trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow. What a powerful message that if we are rooted in Christ and our church, we have wings to love. That's so beautiful. If you make the decision to follow Christ today, I want you to know that angels in heaven are rejoicing right now. Such a beautiful decision that you made to follow Christ and know that you're going to have a family wherever you go as you have one right here with us at Crossbridge. So reach out. Let us be a part of this decision with you, to walk with you. So if you have any questions, any doubts, just reach out to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that opportunity that you give to us to say yes to you over and over. Thank you, God. I pray for each and every one that decide to follow you, to follow the truth, to follow the love that's Christ. <laughs> I thank you, Jesus, for your love that reach out to us and grab us, God. And I thank you for second chances, for second callings. Yes, God, use us, God, for you, for your glory. I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today together, worshiping you, saying yes to you. 
heavily. Amen.